My name is Barbara Bynum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the forum this morning. Um, I know it's chilly. We do that to keep you awake. No, it, um, Kathy and I have control over a lot of things. We do not have control over the temperature. And, um, and we keep asking for them to turn it up a little. And I think part of the challenge is that the HVAC system, the building, we turn it up in here and all of a sudden it's 80 degrees in the welding classroom, which apparently I just did on the wall out there. Um, so, so bear with us, and if you just can expect that it's going to be cold, just dress appropriately, and I'm so sorry, and we'll keep working on it. Okay. The summer's coming. Yeah. <laughs> We're about, the days are about to start getting longer. Um, good morning. I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce James Kaiser, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Montrose Memorial Hospital, our local community nonprofit hospital. He has been in that role since June of 2018, and he has nearly 30 years of hospital administration experience in a number of different locations. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Wyoming and an MBA from Montana State University Billings. James and his wife, Lori, enjoy camping, hiking, backpacking, bow hunting, jeeping, and fly fishing. So it sounds like they have found themselves a perfect home. Let's give James a, a big round of Thank you, Barbara. Well, certainly, we have certainly found the perfect home. Uh, just now, I just need some time to do all those things. <laughs> Uh, Barbara's husband, Archery Hunts, but I think a little more successfully than me. Um, thank you all for coming this morning, and I, I visited with Leanne. I've spoken to several audiences, in fact, this group almost a little over a year ago, um, when it was Heidi's Forum. And um, it really, I thought it went well because it's very didactic. I played off the questions that you have. So I strongly, I've spoken to several of you this morning, strongly encourage you to ask questions. I'll answer them as best I can, and as I'll, I'll share, it's my opinion. Um, and it's from a biased perspective. And I was talking to Sean Sansbury, I said, I'm gonna be pretty critical of health insurance companies today. And I think if you had a health insurance executive here, they could be pretty critical of providers, particularly hospitals. So I am sharing that with a, as, with a bias, um, and as objectively as I see it from my lens and my world. Um, but I do want to also offer that I uh, told so Sean, if, if, if he wants to challenge my thought, I encourage him to, and I want you to do the same um, and answer any questions that I, I'll answer any questions that you have. Um, I think the topic today was, and I used it before in another audience, and, and I had slides, but it's a bit of a distraction. It sort of forces it and doesn't allow enough for question answer. So it was, um, why is healthcare, um, well, how healthcare works or actually how it doesn't work, why is it so costly, and, and, and I think the terms are why are health insurance profits so huge. And I'm trying to get the dialogue, particularly at the state level, to be a little different. Um, and, and, and some of you heard me speak, and you probably could come up and have similar points to the same talk, but healthcare is not expensive. Um, sick and rescue care, which is what a hospital and most physicians do, is very expensive. Um, a person's health of, of what we do as providers of health care is only about 10% of a person's health. Um, a large percentage is our gen genes, which we don't have much control over, but also a large contributor is our lifestyle. And as Americans, we haven't taken very good care of ourselves. So it comes down to nutrition, exercise, alcohol, tobacco use, things of that nature. When we look at longevity, Japan, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, they have more longevity, but their lifestyle is quite different. And sort of to exemplify that, the state of Utah is the healthiest state in the nation. And a lot of that stems around, as you know, the LDS community has a pretty healthy lifestyle. And also they have the lowest cost of health care in the nation subsequently. But there are some factors from health care delivery that contributes to that, and they have an integrated delivery system. And that's three legs. So you have the hospital, the physicians, and then the health plan. And it's owned by Intermountain Health. And each leg keeps the other leg accountable from a cost standpoint. I was able to recruit physicians to Montana from Utah 
because Intermountain Healthcare didn't pay their doctors very much. And so they went to where they could earn a living for their family. And so it's not always optimal, um, but it, in terms of total cost of care, it can keep it down if there isn't a suboptimizing effect. Um, and that's some of the concerns I have with some current legislation, both at the state, particularly at the state, but even the federal level, because we're getting into what is going to be dictated. So when the whole topic came up about health care reform, it was really um, payment reform, and there's really no reform, it's payment cuts. Um, so some of the concerns that I have is if they dictate a rate without being well informed, there are going to be a lot of unintended consequences. Um, I, said, I said sick or rescue care is expensive, so I'm going to give something that um, demonstrates that and then we'll start to this dialogue about it. We had a patient recently that had a, a joint replacement or at least a partial replacement. I think it was a partial knee. Um, it was a long-term care facility and it was through some contractual payment relationship. We received $17,000 for that. The cost of the prosthetic device for us was over $19,000. And that included the staff, the supplies, the equipment. And so that's one of the drivers of cost. Um, there are a lot of factors where their fingers often pointed at providers. Often hospitals, to a lesser degree, physician, everyone loves their physician. Um, I even get sticker shock when I get, get a bill, and I go, no wonder people complain. I had a blood draw a few years ago, and the lab bill was over $700, and I just panicked. I thought, how can that be? But then, and I'm very close to it, and I understand the cost of care. So I'm going to ramble a little bit. I'm getting off on 10 different tangents as thoughts are provoked, but I was just sharing with Leanne walking in this morning. And I think a good presenter to you in the future would be our new chief financial officer, uh, Yvonne Whittington. She um, can articulate sort of the uh, economics of at least hospital health care delivery much more articulately than I can. But of, of our, our, our the, uh, the picture of pie and of our what we're paid right off the bat of, top of, of what the work we produce charges, the hospital produces in work care provided $350 million a year. Of that, we net 132 million. Our costs are over 129 million. So we a, a margin typically is around two million dollars. That's about two percent. This year was one of our better years. We were at five percent operating margin, and that's where you need to be to sustain yourself over time. That is break even. And it's not covering your cost is break even. Five cents on the dollar is break even because you need that amount to replace aging plant and facilities maintain them. We, we got a surprise unbudgeted bill for a $325,000 roof repair, which was a section half the size of this room. And so, and then aging plant facilities and equipment, technology. We're about to roll out a new electronic health record. Um, we were able to negotiate and got that subsidized. It was um, $30 million over five years, and we got it for $8.9 million through working with St. Mary's and Grand Junction. They legally are able to subsidize that. So now we have to examine how, what's the extent we can subsidize our independent physician groups so that they too can have access to the gold standard, EPIC, as an electronic health record in their clinic setting so that they can communicate real time with the hospital in essence, for the most part, have one community-wide health record. And in, in some respects, Western Slope-wide community health record. So when you appear Say you're emergently transferred, wherever you entered that system, they can have real-time access to your history, um, what has occurred, uh, your lab results, things of that nature. Um, so there are a lot of cost drivers. And where I've been critical is traditionally, um, hospitals inflation has been four to 11% annually. Yet we're seeing health insurance premiums rise, as I've been told at one point in the state, as high as 82%. Um, and so I say, why aren't, and then, and then providers get blamed as the cost driver, well, that they're, they're getting more. So, or I'm, there might be a rub, um, while our, it should be proportionate. So if, if, the, if the hospital charge or a physician charge increases 4%, why are it 50 plus percent health insurance premium? And so one of my concerns with some of this, the government's 
direction is while they're talking single payer system, and you think, well then you, why would you need health insurance companies if you had a single payer, the government, as other countries might, Europe for example, Canada. Um, but the government is using them to administer the plan on their behalf. And we've been um, negotiating our physician hospital organization with Rocky Mountain Health Plan, and they said they have a 2% profit margin, the same as the hospital had in 2018. But within that, they have 20, as high as 22%, and I think now it's running at 19% administrative fees, and that's hugely profitable. Um, I, and, and this can be debated, but I've heard someone can, you can operate that at about 8%. And so there's huge margins, but as they ratchet down reimbursement to hospitals and physicians, without, and some of the legislation, I was the first one to testify in the reassurance bill from Colorado Mason University via video. I think that played a little bit better with the legislature because they started, instead of being there present in Denver, I think they, it, it created that they're out in the hinterlands in rural Colorado. Um, but I made the point that in this reinsurance bill, they're looking at it for um, hospital stays or procedures that exceed 25,000, um, the hospital has to pay in so that um, that's offset. The feds are also providing some funding for that, but I challenge, I said the state needs to put into that pool, as do the insurance companies. So we tried to get legislature that supported a discount or a kickback to employers in reduced premiums, and we never got that language in there. It was never guaranteed that the savings, so to speak, would go back to the employers paying these health insurance premiums and reduced premiums. So that's something, as your, as your voice, um, we need to get legislation that as we reduce our costs, as we attempt to, that has to equate to reductions in health insurance premiums for employers. If, in other words, if they're having to pay less, the employer should be able to pay less. Um, <coughs> Wait, hang on, i got to bring you the mic. Are you ready for questions? I am, I, I, and we'll keep going off of that. I'll get long-winded in some of my responses. So. Okay, just make sure that if you have a question, you've got the mic. So it seems like there's a lot of funny money business, and it would be hard to implement any of these things fairly that you're talking about. You give an example of your blood draw $700, but your insurance negotiated rate was probably $250. And so the price isn't the price. So how can you tell, and how can we make good policy if we don't know what is being offered above cost and what's being offered below cost, like your knee replacement? It's a good question. Um, one thing I've challenged Rocky Mountain Health Plan is share your costs, and they say they don't know what they are. Um, we don't have a good cost accounting system, but we have a good sense of what our costs are. Right now, Medicare reimburses below the cost of care to Montrose Memorial Hospital, we lose $56 million a year below our allowed costs by Medicare annually. We lose that. Medicaid's a similar model, so those of you with commercial health insurance are making that gap up. So that's why the $700 bill exists. So in, in some respect, it's almost the haves, according for the have-nots. I don't condone that model, I don't endorse it, but it's sadly that's what it is. And that's sort of, you've heard me say that's sort of trying to force socialism to government payment. 70% of our patients are Medicare, 49% Medicare, the balance of 68% total is um, Medicaid. So you could argue that that's socialism, and then you could say commercial insurance to a degree or self-pay is capitalism, and you're trying to blend them in a model and they don't blend well. I mean, you walk into Walmart, you pay for something. It's not subsidized, so to speak. So it, it, it's challenging. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, taking an attempt at it. But I, I'd be willing to expand on if I'm not. Go ahead. This may take a second. Um, Bernie Sanders says health care is a right. And by that he means rescue care and all the things you make. Um, is there any segment of the medical world, government, doctors, providers, 
that talks about defining health care or rescue care, uh, what the limitations on the system's services might be. Does everybody get a, it, the caricature is, does everybody get a free hip at 95? Uh, where are those conversations happening and, or are they happening? I think they are happening to a degree. Um, I agree with your comment that their health care is a right. Um, I was an exchange student in Sweden um, right out of high school. And you could argue socialized medicine or nationalized medicine, Great Britain, Canada. Um, the average person paid 80% of their income in taxes. Um, so the argument is probably more around cost than care. There's some ethical and religious directives that start to play into that question. Do, do they get a certain hip? Oregon delved in that model. You're, in Canada, they ration medicine, your access to care. So you may wait six months for an MRI or a year to see an interventional cardiologist. So there's some give and takes get with that. I had a cardiologist in Montana and her, she was from Canada, and her mom was gonna die before she got in to see someone. So she brought her here to get care. Um, in terms of the 94 year old getting a hip, I think they should get a hip, but the debate would be is it the Chevy or the Cadillac? And there's a cost to that, the prosthetic device. Um, at least that's a perspective I've heard stated quite often. <clears throat> Rationing care is a challenge. I mean, we, um, we had a, some continuing medical education every Friday for our medical staff or physicians. We bring outside presenters. And one of the, the conversation was around um, al allow natural death. That's better than um, um, do not resuscitate. Sort of the current vernacular is allow natural death. So sometimes for pain, they administer morphine with some religious beliefs. Um, and that became part of the conversation. Um, don't agree with that approach. So that's where the debate's occurring anywhere locally. But on a higher level, at the federal level, um, you look at the silver tsunami, that baby boomers are retiring and uh, they're gonna have a loud voice. And so as the government starts to ratchet down or scale back, they're gonna want access. They've paid into the program their entire life, their career. And so um, I think that 95 year old wants the good hip, they're gonna push hard to get it. Mm. Or their family member is. So if someone's gonna advocate for them. How do you manage that? So, I'm looking for anyone to signal to me that they have a question. So if you have a question, make me, let me know. I'll get to you. Um, so you mentioned that um, Utah uh, has, is like the healthiest state. And you also their cost of the lowest. And, and it's also the, the uh, provides, it has the less cost for providing care, and you, you kind of link that to um, lifestyle. Uh, you know, uh, the state has a lot of Mormons and so forth, you know, no drinking, smoking, and things like that. So the, the question would be, um, what degree of personal responsibility do we all share in keeping ourselves healthy to keep that uh, those costs down? See, and that's, that's health care. So I think it was George W. Bush said the best health care don't get sick. Well, some of us don't have that choice. You know, some of us, my uncle is a drinker, smoker, eat tobacco, you name it, and he's still around and he's costing us a lot of tax dollars and I don't like that. My dad doesn't either. His brother tried to keep him a little healthier. But um, What I'm concerned with, and if I'm an insurance company, but particularly if I'm the government, Medicare, Medicaid. They have a high risk population to care for. They're trying to push that onto the providers of care, physicians and hospitals, by having them inherit that risk. So they're, going to, they're looking at accountable care organizations or population health, and you're gonna be responsible and reimbursed or not on your ability to keep someone healthy. 
well, if that person's not personally responsible, why should I be held liable when I can't get them to take their medication or follow a regimen that helps with their diabetes in terms of nutrition, diet, and plan? Um, get some mobility walk periodically. Um, so while I'm concerned as a hospital, primary care physicians, that's a real challenge. Um, they, but I would hope that sound minds prevail that if they've documented that this is what they've in essence prescribed for the patient, if the patient doesn't adhere to it, should the physician be penalized? Currently, I think it's almost we don't care, but this is all you're going to get. And that's what I'm concerned about the government sub-optimizing healthcare delivery. They risk 100 rural hospitals have closed and have closed across this country in the last 10 years. In the last 15 years, 150 have closed. So there's a real risk, particularly to rural healthcare, um, with some unintended consequence in how their sort of draconian approach to um, just slash and burn, just cut costs, learn to live on it. Um, it can flip an organization upside down. And when, frankly, when a rural hospital goes down, the rural community goes down. We've got 730 employees, um, almost 180 physicians on staff, 100 active locally. Um, we're a large economic engine for the community. We buy groceries here, we buy homes, we bank here. Um, so that helps stimulate the economy. I mean, they say a dollar, you've probably heard me do this, but if we have a $100 million in payroll, that turns over seven times in mantras before it leaves the community. That's a $700 million impact. Now, that, does that justify high charges that we hurt employers' ability to gainfully employ and provide benefits? That doesn't justify it. And that's where it's a challenge we have as a health, as sick care delivery system. We haven't done a good job of telling our story. And so one's conjured up about you, and it's probably one you don't want told, and now it's too late. Legislators don't want to hear from administrators, and now they're getting to where they don't want to hear from physicians. They want to hear from you from community members and why healthcare is important to you and your community. So if any of you are willing to testify to this future legislature, legislature, please let me know because um, we're gonna be challenged. Do we need to reduce the cost of healthcare? You better believe we do. If it were so easy though, we're, we're having a national workforce shortage. I remember when I started my career, they said by 2015, there would be a national shortage of 225,000 physicians. That became true. And so there's a supply and demand at play. We pay some nurses a lot of money, but we have to have someone to deliver care. Um, and we benefit them. And, and it's, it's difficult work. It requires training. And so we're trying to stay in the game. And if you think about it, if, if we could easily or cut cost, why wouldn't we if it's all about the money? Because, like I said, if insurance companies don't, if they pay providers less and don't um, reduce premium costs for employers, that's where their margin profit goes. So why wouldn't a hospital reduce its costs so its profit margin would grow? If we could, we would. Um, we're operating on razor-thin margins. Um, in 2017, we had minus 4% margin, which equated to a $4 million loss. 22 rural hospitals in Colorado <coughs> operated at a, in the red at a loss. And so that's where I think I was really concerned in this state with, again, some of the approach. Um, the governor was here uh, the Saturday before Thanksgiving and said, we're tired of being ripped off. Um, you know, it's easy, just as I'm being critical of health insurance companies, on one side of the fence to lob stones. Um, but it requires getting the stakeholders at the table and let, let's figure this out together. What are some of the drivers of cost? We are. Health insurance companies are. Um, big pharma. Pharmaceutical drugs. You used to be able to, to build your budget. You had to be able to forecast to predict what your costs are going to be. So what is your cost for pharmaceuticals? I was with Providence Health System out of Seattle, 50 hospitals. Um, 110,000 employees, 25,000 physicians, and the, it was out of control, 20% increases in pharmaceuticals annually, and they could never tell us what it's going to be. And there, there's a lot, there are a lot of games played in that industry. They can write off their advertising as operating expenses. 
There's some games they can play with generics and timing. Um, I was on the American Hospital Association Regional Policy Board 8 with the Rocky Mountain States. And the, the case study on that industry is concerning. Um, so as a nation, we're paying for pharmaceuticals for the world, research and development at a premium. And that's why people go across Mexico and Canada. There are no high end, there is no high end imaging equipment manufactured in the United States. And that's because of litigation. We've worked on tort reform. So there, MRIs are built in Europe, magnetic resonance imaging. Those would be great jobs for our country to manufacture all this high end imaging equipment technology, computerized tomography, positron emission tomography, CAT scanners, CT, computerized tomography. Go ahead. Wait, actually, you've got the mic. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, <laughs> about 10 minutes ago. Uh, I, I wanted to get, I think it's back to the reinsurance thing for a minute, but before I do that, I wanted to let everybody here know that you mentioned testifying uh, in support of, of these things. We can do that right here at CMU. We have the facility, we have the, the process set up, we'll get the information out. Uh, I hope Kathy will uh, put it out through this email list as well, that if you have a uh, concern about any legislation, you can... Uh, um, get in line and, and, uh, and get your, your views heard uh, through a link from here. We don't have to go over the hill. Yeah. Okay, back to reinsurance, uh, which is... I, I do want to echo what Bob was sharing. Right. I, I shared how it played better, and I was the first one to testify, so you get to go early. And you don't have to make the trip in weather to Denver or deal with that crazy traffic. I get road rage really bad, even if it's my fault. works <laughs> 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 out great for me. Well, we all, all feel that. Uh, little rage here at times. <laughs> the reinsurance, if I understand correctly, the reinsurance program is really a federal program to help offset premium costs. Uh, and uh, the state of Colorado then applies for that with some legislation, uh, which we uh, uh, tried to help uh, this last year. And uh, I feel that we got a little bit ripped off on that because uh, the state government then saw that uh, here comes some cash uh, and uh, we will create a, their own uh, single payer program uh, to go in competition to others. Uh, competition, I think, is always good. However, they took the money and, and prevented it, and it, it seems they're going to, I mean, it hasn't been set yet, but they're going to um, not pay uh, or support any of the employer uh, programs. So we won't get any there. They won't try to offset the other premiums that we have to pay, which are really hitting us very hard out here, uh, exceptionally hard in the Western Slope. So I wanted to get your view on that if, uh, if that, if that is even a reasonable uh, complaint, uh, but uh, or that we should uh, kind of mobilize. I think I agree with you. I think it was well intended to help lawyers reduce health insurance premiums, but that legislation wasn't baked into the bill as it should have been. And the state should have stepped up with their fair share, and so should have insurance companies, would have been, and as should have hospitals and providers to be part of the solution together. Um, there's another bill that you're aware of that's coming up, and it's a public option. The Colorado Hospital Association, and I don't know how they're viewed by our legislature, it could be negatively, and I don't know if that's the voice we want heard, but they're looking at trying to get rates at 175 to 225 percent of Medicare. Well, I just told you we lost $58 million annually we lose. So when you get 100% of the $58 million loss, you're not doing too well. And even 175% of that. So the position the Colorado Hospital Association has taken, there are some very profitable hospitals in the urban markets, very good, and in the resort communities. And Montrose is being dragged in and rated as, 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 as if we're very profitable. Frisco, for example, Summit County, yeah, 30% profit margin. We have a 2% margin this, last year, and we had a negative 4% margin for that. So they see us as 
high cost like them or high charge, high profit. And that's strictly not the case. So the position we're trying to take, and I don't know how well thought through it is, but what we're requesting, I've ordered an email to Mark Catlin, I should have sent one to you, Bob, but the, um, we're going to ask for a look, particularly for rural communities, total cost of care. So it can't be a percentage. A lot of chasing is Medicare as a reference. It's called reference-based pricing. What, so commercial insurers want to pay providers only what Medicare does? Well, if that's a $15 million less, you implode your delivery system. Well, that can't be used as a reference. But what can happen is, what is our total cost of care? And then let's look together, work together to reduce that cost of care. Um, that's on the public option, maybe more than reinsurance. I think that that needs a lot of work as well, Bob. When you talk about cost of care, I'd like to you to address two ancillary facilities. Um, I've noticed both relatives and fellow employees, if they get a really bad sore throat, say, on the weekend, and they think it might be strep, they run to the emergency room. Um, how successful has it been to channel them toward urgent care instead? And how much of a cost cutter is that? And the other is the surgical center. What role does the surgical center play in all of this? It used to be private. I believe the, does the hospital own it now? Just lots, talk, talk to us about that. Okay, if I stay on one topic, bring me back to the other. But in terms of running to the emergency room and how successful are deterring that urgent care, um, it was requested by our emergency group. We contract with a group of board certified emergency medicine physicians. They wanted to open urgent care and I've opened it out of public outcry and our boards driven in other communities I've been in as a low cost option to the community, lower, lower cost option. Um, so when we ran the numbers on the volumes, we'd lose probably a million dollars a year opening an urgent care. There are two urgent cares in our community so why should we try to gore their ox? They're holding it together. They're not open 24 seven, but they're open extended hours and with some weekends, if not, um, at least Saturdays. I'd, I'd have to look at that more closely. So Cedar Point Health runs urgent care. So it, we, didn't want, that's, we didn't want to put them at risk. They're meeting, I would say, for the most part, meeting community need. Now why aren't, why isn't all the community utilizing that? So this is a discussion we've had with some physicians and even with Rocky Mountain Health Plan Tuesday night, what is today, Wednesday? That was Monday night. And, um, but they say with Medicaid, they're concerned about access. So a Medicaid patient can go anywhere they want at urgent care, River Valley, but a lot of them choose the emergency room. And they say as much as a $2 copay requirement would deter them from it unnecessarily using the emergency room. Yet the government won't let us do that. Ask for $2 and, so, and then Rocky would say $5. But then they would go to a provider that can meet their need, but wouldn't be, our cost probably per visit's over $700. Our cost per emergency room visit is over $700 um, per encounter. So even if they got a $350 bill, we lost $350 plus on that visit. So it's in our best interest also to discourage unnecessary utilization because the physician has to document was this an appropriate use of emergency room and if it wasn't, we don't get reimbursed anyway. So that's a challenge. So there's some personal responsibility there, but the government could help with a $2 copay of Medicaid patients that would discourage that and encourage them to use a better setting of care. So that's the thinking there. Um, Surgery center was the so, other part of the question. Thanks, Barbara. Um, the hospital now is 51% owner, and it, ha it has to work as a not-for-profit. You have to have 51%. Um, is it a lower cost option? It is. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Freestanding entities, I got a moratorium passed against specialty hospitals in Montana, simply because um, they can compete because they don't better compete because they don't offer a full array of services. 
Um, I, I think there's value with an emergency with the surgery center, and I think an ambulatory walk-in surgery center. I think more and more of our healthcare is going to go outpatient because it is lower cost. But some of the government and payers approach, and that's why I said total cost of care has to be looked at. We lose significant money operating the emergency room as the community needs, and we lose significant money of delivering babies, obstetrics. Um, the community needs that. Our service industry needs that. Um, having that helicopter to rescue people is a huge lo money loser. So you can't just look at it per service because right now the reimbursement model, certain services reimburse at a profit. Neurosurgery is one of those. Um, but everything else has been ratcheted down. The orthopedics is only if you manage your cost, because that's razor thin margins now as well. And you see they're high, co they're high charge, but it's the high cost is mirrors the charge. Um, but the val neuro in time, neurosurgery too will no longer reimburse with a profit margin. And we, forever, we've had to learn to live on that by cross subsidizing. So if we made a profit in a certain service, we paid for the baby that lost money or the emergency room visit that lost money. And that's how we've been able to keep it hot, whole. And that's why those with health insurance pay a high premium and then a high charge versus losing 58 million on Medicare patients. So it's cross subsidization. Cost shifting is what they call it, but it's cross subsidy. Um, I'm probably gonna get tar and feathered for this opinion. Um, the 95-year-old who wants to have a knee replacement paid by uh, Medicare, I think that person's being selfish and is putting the burden on his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I know a person who has a medical condition that if they get to a certain point, they'll have to pay $10,000 a month for drugs to keep this person alive. And this person's told me at this point, uh, he's going to elect not to take this medicine because a long time ago, Governor uh, Lamb says that you have a duty to die speech. So that's just an opinion. And I really feel that baby boomers are almost selfish with this Medicare business, wanting a, a knee replacement at the age of 95. I mean, that's just my opinion. Uh, I know I might get tarred and feathered for this opinion, but that's the way it is. <laughs> I'm not going to get tarred and feathered with that. I'm not I sure the government, if you want an elected official and you want to get reelected, do you ever think they'll take that position? But they will cut down those greedy providers of care that are actually delivering care. They'll ratchet them down thinking they're cutting cost, but they're going to, they're putting that delivery system at risk. So that's not the solution either. But they think that, that society supports that move. They might not support the other. So. Okay, back here. <laughs> First, I just want to uh, check my fact on this. It wasn't some legislation passed or something that said in so many years the hospitals are going to have to start to um, reveal their costs for each procedure or the costs at the hospital so that consumers can look at that and then choose maybe where they want to go. Um, is, that, is that true? There's pricing transparency legislation yeah, that's, that's already right. passed federally right. and in the state. And, and it's going to go into effect? It's been effect. I think Leanne posted a year ago. Or so. Oh, you really are. Oh, wow. Good, 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 but, good, good Someone, a gentleman, asked me earlier that question. Oh. It's unnecessarily complex. We have what's called a charge description master, and it is our charge. We, we cannot charge anyone less than Medicare. And remember, so we keep that charge high for a commercial insured patient that's probably came closer to that charge, I think 79% of that charge for the $58 million loss of Medicare, which is less than half of that charge. So it's below cost. So when you see that charge, it's not what we're gonna necessarily charge you. And it's, not, it's definitely not what we're gonna collect. So it's confusing. And so it, I see why the government is attempting to, and we owe you a good faith estimate. Someone mentioned they were self-pay. We've gotta at least figure that out, what it would cost you so some of the challenges we're getting, and again, even if that, so let's say there's been a big public outcry in terms of meeting a, a charge for an MRI. I think, let's say it's 1800 to $2,200. And I think some patients have been sent out of the community to other imaging centers, for example, in Fruta, 
that pays closer to nine charges closer to nine hundred dollars with the radiologist portion of the bill that they read it. Um, we're working on that, but it would require a cash payment promptly, like day of service, and so it would be nine hundred, so half of the charge, eighteen hundred. And the reason we can do that, because it costs so much to try to collect that bill, and it's not just to a collection agency. I have a huge staff in revenue cycle in the billing process, because most payers are now denying almost everything. It's just on that, deny the payment and hope they don't appeal. When I got here, our staff wasn't appealing everything. That's one of the reasons we lost $4 million. We were doing the work, providing the care, but it's a broken system and we've made a lot of improvements and that's why we're sort of keeping our head above water now. We have a lot more to make, but sadly we could have reserved more for the weather, the storms of the future and be here for the community had we been paying attention to that in the past. And so now as the government in particular ratchets down reimbursement, there's not much to collect anyway. So um, it's gonna create a challenge for us, but um, I felt Sorry for a person at a, a presentation we made the other night. She asked about, she goes, I hear hospitals are against pricing transparency. And for the most part, those of you that have insurance, you have a contract with your insurance carrier on what they've negotiated for payment with, for providers, maybe in-network providers, the hospital. And that's a better descriptor of what will be covered for you. Um, and so where hospitals have been resistant is we want that conversation to be between the consumer, the patient, and their insurance carrier rather than the hospital trying to figure it out because it varies so much. And so, but still, that, that is valid or not an excuse. We've, we've got to figure this out. People need to have a sense of what it's going to cost them. And so, that may be one advantage of this single payer system is that there'll be one price and you know what it is and it'd be closer to the cost of care um, if it if it is a model that's sustainable and then it'll be known but until then it's it's all over the map it's hard to be a good consumer of health care when you don't know what things cost yeah. here Lynn, i think you had your hand up. um i just have a question you keep talking about a 58 million dollar loss from medicare could you just um, explain in percentages, that, like Medicaid pays basically, I know it's, I mean, asking for, for money stuff, but Medicaid pays what percentage of your cost? Medicare pays what percentage of your cost, rather than just the 58 million, what percentage? Let me see if I can pull out a slide here real quick. Thank So when I say 58 million, um, put the mic up to your mouth. Please. When I say 58 million, 58 percent um, of our revenue is totally wiped out. So 58 uh, percent. Here's the pie chart um, of what we charge doesn't ever happen. So right then, and then you start looking at other percentages, and I may have something that speaks more to what um, is actual percentage of. But if you figure 60 or 49 percent of our business is Medicare, so 49 is Medicare, and 19 percent, 19 percent is Medicaid of our business of care we provide, and um, I know what the answer is. So contractual allowances is what we might discount the government <coughs> and commercial insurance, and that's 58 cents of the dollar is right off the charge. So when you talked about price and transparency charge, 58 cents of that dollar of charge is gone every day right away. And then, um, so we do, and I'm looking at some of our costs, 15 cents of that total dollar. So 58 cents is gone, 15 cents of that dollar goes to salary and wages. Another four cents goes to employee benefits. And I can give you a copy of this. Medical supplies, seven cents. So you, these are really percentages. I know um, the answer to the question. Yeah, my, my question was really more around 
Medicare. The, the percentage of your revenue I know the answer. that comes in from Medicaid and then the percentage of your revenue that comes in from Medicare and what that percentage of equals your best guess at cost. Um, what I'm trying to get at is I'm understanding the public option is going to be a percentage of Medicare, like you said, 175 to 225. So, so if your cost is this much, and Medicare is going, the, the, you know, uh, uh, everything will be up, subject to change in the legislative session coming up. But if your cost is this much, and Medicare right now pays what percentage of that? I don't know what that is, 58 million is, I don't know. Um, but 175 to 220 percent above what Medicare is paying now seems like a number that would be important. But but again, I just need to know what those numbers it are. It is if Medicare were at okay. cost, so to speak. <laughs> I hear you. But it's below the cost of care. Right. So. Um, okay, we got we got this guy cannot CFO stand it in the back. He's got he's going to throw out some numbers for us. Why you look at that, James? Uh, Medicaid pays about 10% of the actual cost, and Medicare pays about 20 to 25% of the actual cost. Where do those numbers come from? Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> That's what I've read. That's what he's read. Uh, yeah, let's take it for what, you, what it's worth. Um, okay, we're going to move on to another question. Just, just speculating and looking down the future, but uh, it seems that 49% um, being Medicare and probably a huge majority of that, of course, is because of us baby boomers, we, no matter what we think, are not going to live forever. And at some point in the future, there's going to be a whole lot less of us around. How is that going to impact rural care, especially when we're seeing a decrease in the number of babies being born, basically not replacing what we're losing, and how is that going to impact rural Colorado versus urban Colorado? Rural, rural Colorado does have a higher percentage of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, in terms of your right, there are going to be fewer to take care of us. That, I already mentioned a workforce shortage today. It's only going to worsen. Um, is that going to drive up the cost of care? Probably will, because you're going to have to pay because there's low supply, high demand. But that, that baby boomer trend is going to be for a while out there, probably 20 years. Um, it, and then I think it'll be a different model of delivery at that point. Um, we'll see how they hold it together then. We'll see. Okay, I have a question. If prevention is so important as far as driving health care costs are concerned, what is the hospital doing specifically to encourage healthier community? including not just us old folks who go to all the programs, but how about the young folks who are vaping and doing things that are really health care risk? You know, that's, that's, that's going to require a different mindset. So there's some in, in my world, in my industry, that would say, why do we have to be responsible for someone else? So we're here, we were been trained to take care of sick people and rescue them. And as you've heard me say before, we're the best in the world at that. Um, but more and more, forcing that risk up on providers of sick care, I think is the right thing to do. So the hospital, they'll create not only incentives, but more likely disincentives if your po population isn't healthy. So I see in time if I'm Medicare, I'm the government. Okay, Montrose, Colorado, in this count, your county, this is what we spent last year, this is your money, now take care of your population, have the same risk we had. And that's going to force us to help keep our population healthier. So we're going to get more involved. I mean, Leanne and I met on the making uh, Montrose Memorial House bike friendly. So what can we do in the community to make it even more bike friendly, you know, in terms of trail system, healthy lifestyle? Some of you may have heard the term blue zones. Well, it's become a marketing tool, I think a million or two million dollars for a community to pay blue zones to get a blue zone designation. So there are things you can do restaurants offering healthy options, um, expanding your trail system. So it starts, to, it, what it did, it looked at, I think it's called the term centurions around the world where the most um, people live over the age of 100. One, the only one in the United States, I think, is Loma Linda, California. 
And this person said, when you drive off the interstate, you see fast food restaurants. You thought, how can this be? But they're at Seventh-day Adventist, a plant-based diet. And so they interviewed a lady that was 105, and the person asked, what does your body feel like at 105? She goes, well, I don't know, but I feel a lot sexier than I did at 104. (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to say one thing. Actually, the millennial generation is is as large as the baby boomers. Oh, that's good. I'm I'm stuck in between. between. They're now larger. They're now larger. Montrose Memorial Hospital is an independent, standalone, not-for-profit hospital. I know you have a management contract with the with the company, but um, that's a kind of a vanishing breed of hospitals that's not being part of a, a chain. Um, do you see that continuing? And should we care? <laughs> that's why I'm here. I think if you want to see my background, I've. Um, started out an independent hospital in Wyoming, uh, Wyoming Medical Center, the largest hospital in the state there. They're still independent, but then I joined Banner, which was at that time Lutheran Health Systems, then SCL, which is St. Mary's and a lot in Colorado, Sisters of Cherry Leavenworth, and then Providence out of Seattle and Olympia, Washington, and Montana. And a lot of my colleagues that were still independent, I thought, you're crazy uh, to be going this alone. You need the sophistication of a large system and they would say access to buying power. So some of the ways you reduce cost is group purchasing. And there's, that, that's a whole other topic. I can share what we're doing there here to help reduce those costs to a degree. Um, but what I saw happening is in the past, you would join a large health system, get access to capital dollars to help you build a new hospital or buy equipment. But Providence, as was true for other large health systems in recent years, lost $500 million each year in the past two and now probably three or four years. The little hospital I was at, we had a great thing going, the physicians, medical staff, the community, the board, we were aligned, we were making things happen. The community wasn't growing, but we were. Patients were choosing to stay in our community. We had high quality, top 20 in the nation hospital in terms of quality of care, so our reputation was enhanced. Um, One of the reasons I came here, I heard our board is progressive, and they are. So we have high-end technology you don't find in not only other like-sized communities, in very many hospitals in the the nation. And that investment has helped us recruit and retain physicians. We have a high caliber of medical staff here that I think has started, I've talked to Jim Austin about this and some of the physicians they recruited, and then it just started to spiral up. We, as you all know, there's a reason we live here. It's a wonderful place to live, so we can recruit. With this physician shortage, we can recruit top-notch candidates. We're interviewing another orthopedic surgeon Friday. We're getting cream of the crop. Um, that being said, if we were to align with the system, and, and SCL's talking to us, we're aligning them with, with we have several joint ventures. We have San Juan Cancer uh, Center, uh, CareFlight, and now they're helping us with our electronic health record. Um, they value this market. Montrose sends almost $48 million of care to St. Mary's and Grand Junction annually. Mm-hmm. You imagine what, remember when I said a dollar turns over seven times community, we provided those services? Now let's face it, some of those are high-end services that require a lot of volume, if you will, to sustain them. And that's where I could get into the arms race or competition. It doesn't always work in healthcare. Um, you start to dilute the model and it can't sustain itself. Um, but if we double in population as we're forecasted to 68,000 people, we can support those services. And so what a large system does, and that happens to me as a like-sized community, like-sized hospitals, uh, Butte, Montana, St. James Healthcare. When I was there, we, we had 730 employees here. We had 625 employees <coughs> there. It got down to 400 shortly after I left because they centralized business services first in Billings, then in Denver. So they pulled 200 high paying jobs or well benefited jobs out of that community. And now it's even less. As they centralize services, centralization does not equate to standardization. There's some benefits to how we provide care and standardizing best practice, evidence based medicine, so to speak. But centralizing services can weaken communities. Um, we have a larger staff here because we are all things to all people. Um, and I think as a result, we do a better job of it. But 
large system siphon high-end services out of a small rural community. So they would try to siphon it to Grand Junction. Services we provide today, we have four interventional cardiologists, two cardiac catheterization labs. That would jettison out of here, and even Denver's trying to siphon it from Grand Junction. So they're at least sort of uh, overt rather than covert. Banner's been in this market, Centura, and all they're wanting to do is feed the mothership. And so I couldn't get capital for my rural, rural facility where I was with Providence to expand. We needed more beds, more patient rooms, more exam rooms, and then um, we needed 3D mammography. We had to fundraise to get it. They wouldn't let us borrow it from the bank when we had good debt capacity to pay it back. And so I left disenchanted because a system that I thought brought strength actually started, at one of their, part of their uh, mission statement was the communities we serve. They weren't serving the communities, they were serving their large health system. At least what they thought they were doing. Frankly, had they optimized care in each of their communities, the system would have thrived. But that's not how they saw it. And so I see it as more of a threat. Um, so I probably won't be here if that comes again because it will not be in the best interest of this community. So. I think with that, we are going to, well, one more question maybe, but we have to be quick about it. On the um, insurance companies, I think they should all uh, provide for Silver sneakers, <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of uh, what we call greyheads here. You know, as much as I've been critical of health insurance companies, if it's so easy, why doesn't hospitals? I talked about integrated delivery in Utah. A lot of hospitals have built their own health plan. I was talking to Sean about that. What might we do with the school district, with our Kent City County, has gone under trying to do it. Huh. So easier said than done. Okay. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you for Thank you very much. And along the lines of, of keeping yourself healthy, I had a request to put Dr. Um, Chamberlain's PowerPoint to make it available. To